two, one. Recording episode 238. I really should have figured out how to say your last name. Your book says it. Vecchione? Vecchione? Vecchione. 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 Okay, I wasn't even close. You were, nah, you were close. You were close. I was a little close. Author of Crooked Brooklyn. Everybody list or watching. There it is. I'll link it in the bio and in the top comment. That's great. <laughs> little, little eerie. I started and I was obviously I was recommended to you through Bruce Sackman and I was like, all right, getting into another investigator, but great narrator, by the way, it goes with it perfectly. And it's, yeah, it's, per it's very good. Right. And in fact, I'm just finishing up a new one. Um, yeah. We got a, we got a deal just before the pandemic hit to do, um, to do another one of these audio books yeah. about a, um, a Sicilian hitman who used to be an informant for me at some point. So, oh, shit. yeah. So we're, um, uh, my writing partner and I are just about finished. They, we're on the last chapter. We need to turn it in sometime in February, in uh, January. So, um, so hopefully you'll be happy. You'll have me back when, when that I will one. Absolutely. A hundred percent. You don't have a say in the matter of having you back. It's like I tell Bruce, Bruce came on once. And I was like, you're screwed, man. You're coming on my podcast all the time. <laughs> Bruce hasn't narrated his book. Granted, that wasn't you. That was a narrator. But Bruce doesn't have an audio, uh, audio book. Bruce no, he doesn't. With the, he doesn't. We're roast trying. I roast him every time. I'm like, Bruce, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. Well, you know, um, it's with these publishing companies, it's a matter of money. You know, it's yeah. just um, how much money is the book making? How much money do I have to expend for uh, or do they have to expend for the, um, you know, for the actor who reads yeah. it and all the production costs, you know, so. No, I told Bruce, I, I, we're getting way into this for everybody listening. Why don't you introduce yourself? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, always uh, forget okay. to, I always forget to do that. Well, my name is Michael Vecchione, and I um, now am retired from the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. I was chief of the Rackets Division for, uh, for about 13 years, and um, uh, now I'm writing books about the adventures that I had, and I had many during the time I was in uh, the DA's office. So, um, yeah. And thank you very much for having me. It was, uh, it was on, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, your book's bad. Let's say go back to Bruce. I've told Bruce, I'm like, you know, he said the same thing. He's like, I don't know how much, how much uh, it costs, how much. I was like, Bruce, just grab your book, come on my podcast. I'll start recording. I'll just leave the room for eight hours and just read your book. And yeah. <laughs> my gen I tell this to every author I have on. My generation is so ADD. I will not sit down and read a book unless I am forced to at gunpoint. Yeah. But if I can just throw on the audio, I will go. It's the inverse. I will not only listen to what I'm interested in. I will go out of my way to listen to anything and everything. Uh, exactly. I know that. I know that. We're, um, I have to tell you that it was a little bit, um, this is my, this, the one I'm writing now is my fourth. Mm -hmm. So when we got this deal, I was very surprised that it came in the first one came in the form of an audio book. Yeah. And, um, and our agent said, uh, said to me, Mike, this is the, the way it goes now, you know, that's, uh, that's the way of the world. So, um, so I'm happy. I'm happy that it's, uh, I love this audio book, the one that you're talking about. The, yeah. the actor was great. And yeah. he, he's done some of the voices that are, uh, you know, that were there. And he, he, this one that I'm doing now is going to be a little interesting because the, the hitman had this very thick kind of Sicilian broken English, you know, yeah. and he would have talked like this to yeah. me. Yeah. You know, so I'm waiting to see who the actor is going to be that, uh, that they get to, uh, to do the reading. It's, um, it's going to be quite challenging for him because we do a lot of dialogue in the book, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, it's so like it start, started and I was listening to it. I was like, all right, awesome. Like great firsthand account, but I was only like, I don't know what, 20 minutes in and it got to the point of like, yeah. So they like killed the guy, right. They whacked him, they threw his body out in the woods. And again, I was like, all right, you know, seems like it's par for the course. Right. And then they return or then they take the return, they get the skull and they punch the teeth out. So there's no dental records. That's when I went, oh, shit. <laughs> I, was like, yeah. I was like, this is just is jumping up a notch. Yeah, but, it, 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 was, um, it was quite a case. You know, the first, when, when I first started with that investigation, the first thing that came to my mind was the Sopranos episode where they took the guy into, the Russian guy into the, um, into the woods to kill him. Um, and, um, and he disappears. They shoot him, but he disappears. And, um, and that's what this was like, because when, the, when the, the driver of the car, who was my informant, told me the story, and he said he heard the shots, 
And, uh, and then nobody came out of the woods, not the, um, you know, certainly didn't expect the guy that got shot to come out of the woods, but he expected yeah. his partner to come out of the woods. Yeah. He didn't come out. And um, so he went in, as you probably have gotten to the point at this one, he, he went into the woods to see what was going on and then gets attacked by the guy who has two bullet holes in his chest. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then he's, and he gets attacked and gets knocked down and he's actually fighting with the guy yeah. when, when the, uh, the shooter comes out and crushes yeah, his crushes, skull with a two by four. Stolen, yeah. Yeah, no, I got through, no, I got through the whole book. It's a great book. It's. Oh, you did. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. good. Good. I'm happy to hear that. Come on now. I'm a professional. If I'm going to have a guest on that wrote a book, I'm going to listen to their damn book. They're giving yeah, me their great. time. They're coming on, giving me content. I'm going to listen to their book. Terrific. Yeah. Terrific. I would, I would feel like a hooker. If yeah. I, I feel like a low class hooker. You know what? I am. I may be a hooker, but you know what? I'm a high class escort. I go for wow. Russian oligarchs. I'm not a hooker. There you go. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, it's. So it, as when I, I had on Jack Garcia two weeks ago, or last month, mm-hmm. two Mondays ago. How is he? I know Jack very well. Is he? Is he? Is he? Yeah, he's healthy. Awesome. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. He and I, he and I text. We text each other memes. He's a he's a funny guy. He's, yeah, uh, he is. He's coming on again Monday. But in his and so he was talking about, you know, wearing a wire. And I guess in my mind, because despite all of the like Cold War history I devour, I just assumed that wearing a wire was still the same as like 1950s and you had like telephone cable in your shirt. No, no. And you're, I just assumed because, you know, I'm an idiot. I was like, man, how do they still wearing wires? But you go into your book. I mean, it's, they say it's as thin as a human hair and they, the guy just weaves it into the lapel. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, that, oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. And you, and you know, the, um, what it was connected to, those were the microphones, you know, usually, with the new, with the technology that we were using, you don't need to use microphones, that the device is so sensitive that it picks it up. But we, in that case, wanted the microphones because the judge, it was a, obviously, you know, it was a, it was a crooked judge mm-hmm. who was shaking down a lawyer for money in order to sign a, um, to sign a settlement on a big case. Yeah. He would whisper into the into the lawyer's ear. Yeah, yeah. So we were afraid that the device, which would be in his pocket or somewhere else, wouldn't pick it up, and that's why our detective George was able to. Um, he came up with that idea about the uh, about the wires in the lapels of his jacket. So, yeah. You yeah. know, I got I got to tell you this time when we asked the lawyer, we said to him, "Next time you come in, we're going to wire you. Bring a jacket." And he said, "Well, what for? What reason?" Yeah. We said, "And bring a jacket that you don't want anymore, you know, because yeah. we had to cut it open and and yeah. and do the tailoring." So yeah. it was um, worked perfectly. I got to tell you, the the quality of the audio tape of the the recording was was fantastic, you know. Yeah, so. and it well that that sent me off on this like whole mental rabbit hole if you can't tell this podcast there's no there's no topic there's no we just let it run it's yeah so after listening to that the human thin as a human hair and moving into the i just began thinking i was like man how many like i'm just thinking cold war even through today i'm like how many like nice suits have been gifted how many suit stores have you know or have cia fronts in hong kong or beijing or moscow how many you know how many night or even just intercepted mail you ordered a you know ordered a new sweatshirt but you know we got to keep an eye on that timing character you you tag it slice it open i I wouldn't notice there's a bunch of little strings in here that just got me thinking then it got me thinking about like secret service and everyone in the white house and it's like it's probably this whole i mean granted i know they're all connected we are there but it just got me thinking i was like oh man it is it gets shadier and more shadowy very quickly than I ever imagined. Oh yeah, let me tell you another suit story. It's, sure. it, it's a, it's a, um, it's in the new book and it's a little different, but it's a suit story and it's, it kind of fits in exactly what you were saying. So this, this, this guy that we're writing about, um, he's re- he's enlisted by the Bonanno crime family to transport heroin across the country from New York to Los Angeles. Okay. And of course he has to. Um, you know, it's before 9-11, of course, and it, and um, so there wasn't the kind of scrutiny that there is now with um, with smuggling things onto airplanes. It's almost impossible. Yeah. Back then, it was still difficult, but um, but not impossible. And so what they had him do, the the uh, the wise guys, his handlers, they had him buy a suit that was several times bigger than him, and he was a small, short but heavy guy. 
And um, the suit was big and had deep pockets. They had to get it custom made. So when he would get, he, when he would smuggle the heroin, he would fill the pockets in this big suit with the heroin packages. And, uh, and we're talking about kilos. We're not talking about, you know, little dime bags. We're yeah. talking about a lot of heroin. And um, what he would do is wait until the, uh, just before the doors to the plane would close and then rush up with his ticket to the ticket yeah. taker yeah. and, uh, and get on. Cause no one would, you know, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, but, and no one cared cause he was a heavy guy. So he had this big fat suit on, yeah. but the fat was really packages of heroin. And, and he did it in so, and he couldn't fall asleep of course on the, the cross country trip cause they were afraid that, you know, someone would, uh, would get wise and maybe touch him or wake him up or something. And uh, they were afraid that that would yeah. blow the whole thing, whole deal. Yeah. He did. He did several of those trips, about 15 of them, across the country with the packages of heroin, and um, and never got caught once. So it's, it's unbelievable. Insane. Yeah, yeah. I, I moved. Uh, I moved home in 2016 from Georgia up here to Maryland, and I just I just threw all my clothes in like trash bags, just big black trash bags, and didn't think anything. Just threw it in the back of my little Honda Civic. I mean, I had been in a college town for like six years. Right. Drove home and just kind of being. I mean, there's no other word for it, just being lazy. I just didn't take them out for like months because I was, I don't know, I had workout clothes. I had clean socks. I was like, I don't, you know, I don't need all that other shit just being a guy. But I was also going up and I was visiting my grandmother in New York. So like once a week for like a year, I was just driving from Maryland to New York. And I remember one time I, my dad walked out and was like, saw my car and was like, what is all that? And I was like, oh, it's just clothes. And he's like, you're going up and down this corridor? I was like, yeah. He was like, you're going to get pulled over by a black SUV one day because they're going to think you're a mule. And I was like, for what? And now I'm like just packed to the ceiling with like trash bags and I'm going through like downtown Manhattan and yeah. stuff. I'm parking for hours in weird spots, doing nothing wrong. But in my mind, I'm like, oh, I didn't do anything wrong. But yeah, that might not have been a good idea. But well, let me, <laughs> let me give you, let me tell you another one, another story sure. about on the same topic. Sure. So the same guy was, was uh, tasked with flying to Miami meeting a guy down there who had a red Porsche, a small red Porsche. He was his, his compadre in this whole operation. And, um, and he met him. And the reason that my guy was going down there was to literally ride shotgun in this two seater Porsche with a hundred pounds of heroin in the back of the Porsche. And they drove from Miami all the way to Brooklyn. And, um, and the question that I had for him was, how the hell did you not get stopped? And they, he didn't. But when he testified, this guy was such, was so good as a, as a, a witness. He was, ta he was called by uh, President Reagan's commission on organized crime to testify in front of Congress. And, a con and one of the commissioners asked him, why did you have the shotgun? And his answer was, I can't guard heroin with a lollipop in my pocket. I have yeah. to have a heroin, I have to have a shotgun on. Because yeah. he was, they were afraid, not of the cops. Yeah. They were afraid of, you know, somebody, yeah. a highwayman of, uh, you know, uh, to use a very odd term at this point, but someone to steal, you know, to steal all the heroin. So, um, but he did that. He did that a few times all the way up the Eastern seaboard without getting stopped once by the police. The commissioners of the, on this commission were, were shocked that law enforcement, that they, they got through law enforcement. But when you think about it, if you don't give the police any reason to stop you they're not going to stop you you know so yeah. two guys riding in a in a red porsche from miami to new york is not necessarily gonna cause yeah. I, I think i would have used a different car because it yeah. is a flashy car but uh, but they made it and, that might, um, but that might be even the move is to use a flashy car hide it in plain sight be like these yeah. idiots wouldn't possibly be doing this because they're in such a flashy car yeah right? yeah exactly exactly Maybe it's just, exactly. you just it's just i don't know two bachelors in a flashy car you know, whatever they're living their yep. best life. Yeah. Well, yeah. he did it. He yeah. did it. So that's what I always think of is like, man, if you really wanted to traffic drugs, what you'd do is like you'd put it in cars of people that don't know they're even trafficking. Like, right. Yeah. That'd yeah. be the way to do it. I don't know how you would do it, but I don't necessarily mean like someone's trafficking something and they're they're not in the need to know, so you don't tell them what it is. I mean, like you would somehow f in all of my crime brilliance, like I know what I'm talking about. You'd somehow <coughs> find someone that didn't even know that they were trafficking. Like a, I don't know, like a U-Haul truck. You would just, I don't know, GPS tag it. Just, cause that's gonna be the most, because they actually don't think they're doing anything wrong. Right, 
Right. It's happened. It's happened yeah. where they duped people into thinking that it's one thing and really it's something else. So it's, um, it's not, not unheard of, you know? So, um, yeah. but th so this, the, the other thing with this guy is that they sent him to Chicago a number of times too, to, to mule, uh, heroin back and forth and, but not with a plane with a train. And the reason is because he was trafficking it with, uh, in suitcases. And if he was on a plane back then, if he had a suitcase that size, you would need to check it. So they didn't want to run the risk of somebody getting nosy and opening it. So he took the train and, um, and he had to have the suitcase with him the entire time so that nobody would, would disturb it. So, um, so they were ingenious in terms of getting this stuff, um, you know, around the country. And, um, and, and, and this was all part of, of a, an operation that was dubbed the pizza connection because what they were doing was, the, the, the heroin was coming from Sicily and it was being smuggled into Canada and to the United States in boxes that contained pizza supplies like olive oil and, um, and cheese and, um, and, uh, and, and, and tomato sauce, that kind of thing. And, and they had pizzerias from New York to Chicago that were part of the operation and stuff would come in and then somebody would go to the pizzeria and take the, the, uh, the heroin from wherever it was, um, However, it was smuggled in. So um, Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's good. It's it's it, it. Luckily, luckily, they had at the same time there was an FBI agent like Garcia, but it, but you know this guy Donnie Brasco, the yeah. Donnie Brasco story. He was embedded with these people with the bananas at the time, and um, and learned of the operation, and that's how it started. The investigation started, and then it got busted several years later. So. Um, so my guy was one of the mules uh, and a very, very um, successful mule too. Never got arrested. Never. So um, how do you think uh, self-driving cars are going to play into this whole equation? Because what if you can just, you know, because they're talking about, obviously they're not at 100, they're not at 100% automation yet, but I mean, right. it's coming. And then what's also coming is them, it's kind of, it's kind of funny. Uber was like, uh, apparently Uber contacted Tesla like two years ago. And they're like, hey, like we'd love to go in on a business venture. We'll let you get in on like our market and you use your self-driving cars. And Tesla was like, We don't need you. Like we have the self-driving cars. That's the that's the hardest part of the equation. Like we'll right. figure out an Uber system. But point being, what if something like that happens and you just get some cyber truck with like a thousand mile range and this podcast not sponsored by Tesla? But if you just get some cyber truck, right? And you just have that thing pull up and um I don't know. You just throw a suitcase in there or just, you just have a bunch of self-driving heroin that if it gets caught, there's no one in it. And is that a problem? Is that going to be well, a problem? Here's, here's why they would, I don't think that they would do it for long distances, short distances. Maybe they would be afraid of exactly what you just said. Something happens to the truck yeah, and it, it breaks down. Then they lose the entire cargo sure. and there's a lot of money to be lost. You know I mean? Yeah. That stuff is, if you're talking about, so let's say now in this day and age, Mexican cartels trying to um, smuggle that stuff across the border and then up into the United States, they're not in the business of losing money. So um, I'm not sure that they would take a chance using a self-driving car. Yeah. But but let's say from New York, in New York, from let's say Brooklyn to Manhattan, okay. or from, and, and my guy transported a lot of drugs from Brooklyn to, uh, to other parts of Brooklyn. Brooklyn's a big... Yeah. It's a big borough in terms of distance. So he would go from North Brooklyn to South Brooklyn with, um, with, with pounds of heroin in the car. And um, so that kind of a, a trip would be something that I think a self-driving car might be used for. But they're, they're too selfish, particularly yeah. the wise guys. They're not going to run the risk of losing you know, that kind of product. Yeah. Um, just for the sake of somebody not getting arrested. Because yeah. the person that they have to mule it, they don't care is is expendable they don't they don't care if he gets caught as long as he keeps his mouth shut you know yeah so well it, it made me think of those like uh, have you ever seen those excuse me have you ever seen those like nar narco subs yes submarines i mean those carry literal tons like two thousand pound units of cocaine from yep. south america up through the gulf of mexico but they lose those all the time because it's when the manned subs they have no the manned subs they have i believe can go underwater but they're unmanned ones. They haven't mastered it yet. So they have to stay just below the surface. Kind of like, they're only like sub, sub submerged. Yeah, I gotcha. I, got I mean, you. but those are, but those are autonomous. And those, I mean, 
and they get busted all the time. There's, I mean, yeah, and those have, I mean, those can have up to 10,000 pounds of product, of like right. finished product. So it's, you know, when you're looking at quantities like that, maybe not a pound here or a pound there, but when you're looking at like a score that big, maybe there is temptation to be like, how many mules do we have to pay to get that? Versus, you know, these guys, although greedy, I mean, that same exact greed and selfishness, I think could argue for automation because they're like, I mean, hell, they're businessmen. They're like, hey, let's cut out the middleman. Yeah, but here's what happens. The first time one of the cars gets busted with the stuff in it, so, now the police are, are on the lookout yeah. for cars with no drivers, and they know yeah. that that they're being used by yeah. – um, yeah. so so it's um, it's an idea, but one that I think needs a lot more thought. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. To, I, I realized it. as I'm saying this, I'm like, I'm trying to put together this argument in my head, and then I'm like – Oh, like I'm literally talking to a guy that busts this shit. And I'm like, why am I trying to be like, no, let me explain <laughs> to you. Like, my, I know you think you got an idea, Mike, but I'm friends with, you know, I just read a book called Crooked Brooklyn. So let me tell you about what I learned. But um, to do kind of complete 180 with the, when they're surveilling the, uh, the judge, right? And they're putting this stuff in the ceiling, the whole yes. ceiling and all that shit. And the guy doing his little cigar dance and, you know, taking the 200 out and all that stuff. Yeah. How high up does that go? Do you think that, I mean, because that, I mean, that's, you, I always think of just like, you know, that'd be like a stupid person like me. I'd be a mule and I would get caught doing something. But a Supreme Court judge for the state, I mean, what, how high up does it go? And how well, easy the, is it? The, the three judges that were caught by, you know, me in this, this investigation were it was individual. There was no other way, there was nobody else involved. And the reason for that is the judges who were involved couldn't take a chance that if they were involving someone else, because they didn't have to involve anyone else, uh, but if they did, there was a chance that that person would give them up. Now, what happened with the first one was he was greedy and he, he told the lawyer who was, he wanted, this is the case in which the lawyer was representing the, the infant in the, and, and in order to, to have the infant's settlement um, completely done, a judge had to sign off on it. So the judge took advantage of it and said, pay me, otherwise I'm not gonna sign off on the infant settlement. The problem was that the, he, he picked the wrong guy. You know, the, the lawyer um, at the time, and I'll tell you what I mean by that, the lawyer at the time was um, was concerned for himself and also maybe thought that this was a sting and he was going to get caught if he didn't give it up. So he gave it up. Um, so he picked the wrong guy. The judge picked the wrong guy. But there was no one else involved in that except the judge. And you don't have to go any further. In order to do to be successful with what these judges did, which was to shake down lawyers and clients, you do it quietly. You do it inside your court, inside your robing room or your chambers, which is why we put the recording device and the videotape in the chambers, you know? Yeah. So, um, but what happened and, and what I meant before by the lawyer, this lawyer must have learned from what the judge was doing because about, I would say two or three years later after the case was over, he got arrested and charged in Manhattan for stealing his client's funds. He was yeah. taking client funds and, and, uh, and, and using it for his own purpose. So, um, so he wasn't the most honest guy in the world when we, when he was involved with us, yeah. but, um, but to I, answer your question, nobody else higher than these judges. However, you saw the other case involving the Democratic leader um, of the of the party in Brooklyn, yeah, uh, Clarence yeah. Norman. Yeah. He the, he he used a lot of other people. And my particular my personal opinion, although we never were able to get the, for this specifically, was that judges were paying him off in order to get his endorsement for them to get to the to the Supreme Court. So, um, so that's a different situation, but the judges were, were just greedy bastards and, you know, a bunch of fucking rats. Yeah. That's yeah. Well. Scummy, sleazy rats. And you know, not for, with regard to Garson, who was the guy that had the, the, uh, video and the audio in his chambers, he wasn't getting a lot of money from, from this lawyer. Yeah. He was, but that's how greedy he was. He would, he yeah. would, 
lunches and dinners and you know and and wine and scotch and you know that kind of stuff and it's it's the no, hunt. So. it's not necessarily the, the the take i think it's the hunt right oh yeah yeah the, it's it's the they could get away with it it's yeah it's a little dopamine hit garson was when he was a lawyer before he became a judge i shouldn't say when he was a lawyer he was always a lawyer but when he was in private practice he worked uh his one of his one of the major clients he had was the taxi industry in um in new york and he was in order to take care of his business there he was um taking care of judges at the time so he could make sure that his client you know would would get the most favorable treatment so when he then went on the bench and became a judge, basically what he said was, it's my turn. Yeah. You know, it's my turn. Yeah. I, I'll tell you one little, one, one little uh, anecdote. I would, in the middle of this whole investigation, I'm walking from the Supreme Court building over to my building, which was uh, not far. It was, you know, a block or two. And I, I get a guy who I didn't know, I didn't know who he was. And he was standing by the Supreme Court building and, uh, and I think I put this anecdote in the book and he kind of calls me. I yeah, look at yeah, him and, said, yeah. and he said, and he was a court officer. And he said, he said to me, first of all, you, you know, would. you're doing the right thing. Yeah. He said, but uh, I got to tell you another story. He went from one judge, in the, I'm sorry, not went from one judge. He was working for a particular judge who was in the criminal term. So that meant he dealt with criminal cases. There's no money to be made by judges who are crooked in the criminal term. However, when you move to the civil side where you do money cases, yeah. then you can shake down people and, and settlements and stuff. So this judge had the gall and the balls to say in front of an, his whole staff, we're moving to civil starting next term, and now we can make some money. That's, ins so, that's insane. Out in the open, not even a, not even a problem. Not even a problem. So... Um, yeah. So that's that's the way, you know, and I thought when we had finished these cases that we had made an impact on, you know, the way judges were chosen and, and how they operated. And it turns out that um, I don't think we had any impact at all. I think it was they just kind of flicked it and said, those guys got caught too bad. Now let's get back to business, you know. So <laughs> it, it was um, they treated, I got to tell you something, Tom, they treated me like, uh, like shit. I was a pariah, you know, I would go to, to Christmas parties or to bar association events and nobody would come up, nobody would come to me except one judge who was a really good guy. I knew, I knew him for a long time and he came up to me, kind of whispered to me and he said, you're doing the right thing. Keep it up. You know, good. so good. that made me feel good. The rest of them can go to hell. You don't want to yeah. be liked by those people. There's a bunch no, of no, people, I, yeah. There's a bunch of shitty people around you that give you accolades. You're not doing something right. If a bunch of shitty people are looking at you, if you're in a room with Hitler, Stalin, and Mussolini, and they're looking at you and they're like, "Look at this pussy." Good. Yeah, Good. that's a regret. That's a that's a feather in the cap, right? Yeah, I know. yeah. You don't you don't want to be in. I mean, I get it's easier said than done. You know, that's that's the field of work you're in, and yeah, it definitely has you know socially limiting, and it can start to make you question, what are you doing? Is this worth it? It's, but you got to stick up for what you think, and not necessarily even what you think is right, what you objectively know is right, right? It's right, absolutely. It's not an absolutely. argument. It's not. I think you shouldn't be able to shake down. No, it is. That is, we're not. We're not arguing, you know, is what's your opinion on gravity? I think it's 9.81 meters per second squared. Is that, no, 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 that's what it is. There's no, well, you know, it might be a little lighter. Right. But move from that corruption. What, what do you think is going on, right? Because today, November, say 6th or 5th, I can't keep track. November 5th, 1.30 p.m. East, 1.29 p.m. Eastern time, 2020. We are in the midst of. Of course, 2020 can only deliver an election like this. I don't know right. what, what hope right. I thought or what, yeah, what hope I thought I had that like- The hey, year from hell. Yeah, right. I've been so op nauseatingly optimistic. I've had on Delta Force guys and they're like, stop with your doe-eyed bullshit. And I'm like, no, we got to stay positive, guys. And my logic was, is regardless of my political leanings, I was like, I just wanted someone to win decisively. Biden mm -hmm. or Trump. I was like, just maybe we can just have- Whatever, because if that's the case, then democracy still wins. I said that the day before, and I was like, you know what? Democracy is still like a, like a schmuck. And of course, now here we are, and it's the whole thing is just diarrhea on fire. So that being said, 
what is what is happening do you, is there is there is there a guy like you out there that's figuring out what the hell's happening? And I'm not even trying to go pro or against anyone. Everyone knows my leanings on this podcast, but I don't even want to do that. Just objectively, is there someone? Is there an archangel looking over right now and finding out what the hell is going on with these ballots? Well, the only way I can answer that, Tom, is is to say I hope so. But I I have to tell you, I have to tell you this, and this probably answers the question better than anything. When we, when I first got into this corruption investigation, which took about five years of my life, you know, in terms of to, to do it, it went from one case to another, to another, to another. When we were about, when I had the idea of putting the videotape and the audio uh, in the judge's chambers, yeah. And I went to a guy who worked for me, who had been around a long time. He had done a lot of investigations. He had done a lot of organized crime investigations, was involved with wiretaps. And I told him what I wanted to do. And his answer to me was, his comment was, are you fucking crazy? Are you crazy? You can't do that. Nobody has ever put a camera or audio device in a judge's chambers. I said, well, that's not necessarily the you know, the deciding factor that no yeah. one's done that. I said, what do you think about it? He said, well, you know, I, I don't think you should do it. So I then said to myself, now I really am going to do it. Yeah. Because I was, I was certain that I was right about this. And yeah. I was certain that if we did that, we were, it was going to bear fruit. And, um, and you see, it surely, it surely did. Yeah. And it led to, it led to the whole investigation three judges, the number three person in the New York State Assembly, another assembly person uh, who was in a different situation. But all of this came from this investigation because people felt, as you just asked, is there somebody out there who will listen to me? And they found out that there was. When the lady who was, or the woman who was involved with the judge who was fixing her divorce case, had gone to another prosecutor's office. The F they had gone to the FBI. She had gone to the uh, federal prosecutors. She had gone to the attorney general's office. And they basically all said to her in so many words, the same thing my, my colleague said to me, are you fucking crazy? We're not, there's, there's no way, you're out of your mind, you're nuts. So what happened was she saw on TV, on the news one night, the sentencing of the first judge that we convicted. And um, the guy with the with the microphones, you know, on his in the lapels of the lawyer. Yeah, yeah. And saw that there was a prosecutor out there who would actually take judges on. Yeah. And she came to us the next day, had a sit down with one of my uh, one of my colleagues who was riding, we call riding the guy that's on call to take these kinds of cases. And, uh, and I got to tell you, and I think I write this in the book, that he had gone to um, people who were just below me in, the bureau, in my, my division, and they said to him the same thing, are you nuts? This lady's probably crazy. But he didn't give up. He went to George Terra, who was a detective uh, in the office, and George uh, interviewed the woman, Frida Hanumoff, and um, he came to me and he said, Mike, I think there's something here. And I trusted George, you know, uh, 100%. And I said, let's do it. And that's how I got involved. Now, I took the case myself mm -hmm. because obviously there were people who worked for me who were not comfortable with doing this. So I did it myself. You know, if, if, um, if you want to be a leader, you got to be able to get into the trenches. And, uh, yeah. and I did. And, yeah. um, and I did it. And, um, but there are, Tom, as you know, there are people who are afraid of what the consequences may be, even though they know that, what they're, doing. they're they're doing the right thing and therefore they shy away i didn't you know yeah. i didn't shy away um, because you're a man that's why well i got to tell you that it did cost me but um you know it well, uh well no but, one's gotten anything you know, worth it for free i'm still here and exactly. uh and wrote the book and you liked it so that's i the, loved uh, it and i'm gonna plug it on my podcast but you're thank right thank you i hate thank you. that logic of no one's ever done that before okay yeah. if, if we stick with that logic we would still be, we wouldn't even be in the caves. We would be primordial, like amphibians, like right. looking at the beach. And like, I think I'm going to crawl up on the beach with my fins and all our fishes are going, no one's ever done that before. Yeah. I think I'm, I got an idea yeah, for this thing. It's called the wheel. 
no one's ever done that before. Dumbass, stay here. On and on. I'm going to – I mean, imagine the Wright brothers. Imagine being alive in 1902 and seeing these two jackasses on the beach with three-piece suits and a thing made of balsa wood, paper mache, and a diesel engine. And he's like, I'm going to go flying. They'd be like, what the hell are you smoking? Yeah. And then he did it. And then 12 years later, 13 years later, the entire – the great – the first world war was – arguably decided by airborne surveillance the point is is the idea that you're not gonna do something because no one else has done it it's, 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 it's nuts hey listen you know the the first book that i did friends of the family which was the mafia cops case that case sat in the federal prosecutor's office for 10 years the allegation sat in boxes for 10 years until Tommy Dage, the detective who worked with me, came to me and said, I got this. You want to do something? Now, this is another case. Nobody, you imagine sitting around and I taking on two detectives um, with I a 10-year-old case? I haven't read that. Is that one on Audible? Um, I don't think that they did an audio book of it. But it's probably going to because we just, um, we just signed a, a big deal with, um, are you familiar with Terry Winter, the, uh, the writer? He wrote... Wolf of Wall Street. Oh, okay, yeah. Sopranos. Okay, yeah. yeah Boardwalk yeah. Empire. Yeah, okay. Well, he is now signed on to um, oh, to do shit. this uh, to do Friends of the Family as hopefully a TV series. We're oh, uh, we're yeah. very very close. Yeah, yeah. We um, we we signed it. So I think what's going to happen is um, Harper Collins, which was the publishing company, is going to more than likely re-release the book, um, and uh, I'm going to push on push them for. Uh, you know, to do an audio book because I think that that's the way of the world. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's like I tell Bruce, Bruce, who I love, I love you, Bruce. If it's not on Audible, I will, I, I'll, I'll go and buy it on Kindle and then you can get your phone to read it to you. The problem is it's in that shitty robot voice, you know, it'd be like, yeah. look at yeah. Brooklyn, hi, Michael, Becky, yeah. today, and it's just, it, there's no inflection, it's all, but I was going to say, friends of the family, let's backtrack from that. That could be another episode, and I will buy that on Kindle, and you and I can do an episode on that. So let's yeah, not, don't, I, don't I, spoil it. Don't spoil it. Let's no, I won't. I won't. Okay. You okay. just um, – it's, uh, it's a terrific um, – I mean, these guys, these two detectives thought they got away with this. They were mob payroll, killing people for the mob, and, and they thought that they retired. They were in Las Vegas, living yeah. in Las Vegas. Ten years, and, um, and then we – Right now. I'm going to go well, on Kindle right now as we're talking. I'm going to buy it. Friends of the family. Friends of the, for everybody listening, just stand by. Friends of the family. Come on. Family. Yeah, you might have to put one of our names in. The, 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 the uh, authors. Yep, there it is. Top one. There you go. Friends of the family. And got it. Terrific. Well, when you read it, after you read it, have me back. We'll talk about it. It's another, I will. I will. another yeah. unbelievable case. And I'm you sure know. you can track your sales so you can call my bullshit. I did just buy it. So yeah. with what do you think as someone that did kind of surveillance like this, what do you think about what do you think about something like like Project Veritas that seems to be getting a ton of shit from all mm -hmm. sides this year? But and they do have leanings. That's undeniable. And I get it. And I can get if people that don't lean that way can cognitively, cognitive dissonance can kind of push it away. Sure, I get it. We all do it. You see someone you like getting bad rep and you just kind of block it out. We're all guilty of it. We do it with sports teams. We do it with lovers, whatever. But there does seem to be a certain, and your book proved this, there does seem to be a certain objective, concrete quality to just a video or audio of someone incriminating themselves. And I feel like in a world right now where it's all an information warfare from the left and from the right, from Fox and CNN, from the DNC, from the RNC, everyone's trying to screw each other and paint everyone in a, in a bad light. And there's, you never know what's real, what's fake, what's an actual email, what's a manufactured email, what's foreign intelligence. I mean, it is as Dale Comstock, the guy I've had on here who worked for the CIA said, it's a foggy forest of mirrors. I feel like the only way to kind of cut through all this bullshit is you do have to do what you guys did. And you just have to get video and audio of the person doing the thing that you are claiming they did. There, there's no question that that makes a case. Listen, I, I've done, I've done many, many, many trials in my career. Yeah. 
I've done many investigations. I've done some where I took other people's work and, um, and did the cases, but I've done a lot myself. And when you have concrete evidence as opposed to a witness just telling you yeah. or telling a jury what happened, it's like night and day. Yeah. Um, particularly with, um, with cases involving you know, wise guys, because they, you could get a million uh, witnesses, not witnesses in sense that I've seen it happen, but yeah. people who hear other people you know, do stuff and do say things and things like that. And, um, and, but the person who's telling that to the jury is as bad sometimes as the person who's on trial. So you need corroboration. You need, when you have it, and you have that kind of corroboration like we had with the judges, well, you know, a jury is going to look at it and say, I saw what you just did. It's not, I heard somebody tell me you just did it. I saw it. So, you know, it's very difficult to get around that. And, you know, in the judge case, in, in Judge Garson with the, the video, you know that he, he and his lawyer actually said to the jury that, what you see, don't believe what you see. He actually, they actually, the lawyer actually said that. And because he said that he did not take any money. So I remember standing up and replaying the tape where he takes the money that was handed to him by the cash that we gave to the lawyer to give to the judge. And he counts out a few bills and puts it in his pocket on yeah. videotape. The 200. So I said to the jury, he wants you to believe that what you just saw is a figment of your imagination. So to answer your question, there is no doubt that when you have someone on videotape, audio tape also, when you have someone's voice is also as good, but not as good as the videotape, yeah. um, that you're going to be successful 9.9 .9 times out of 10 in terms of a, of a case. There's no doubt about it. And I've done cases, Project Veritas used to bring us cases, yeah. um, corruption cases, you know, of, of local officials. We had a few, um, and, uh, and those, I can tell you, those, those tapes are invaluable as far as, um, yeah, not necessarily. And, and, and I mean valuable in the sense that you don't necessarily have to go to trial because someone looks at that with a lawyer and they say to themselves, I better cut my losses here and yeah, do what yeah. I can to get out yeah. from under this, you know? Yeah. So, um, it's a, uh, it's, you know, it, it's a invaluable invaluable yeah. and um you know that's why we did it i mean just think about this tom i'll go back to what that colleague of mine said no one's ever done that before yeah so let's assume we i took his 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 advice and didn't do this so now i would have a crooked lawyer on the witness stand testifying against the supreme court judge and the crooked lawyer who admits to being crooked says oh i paid that guy money well now the lawyer who for the judge gets up and cross examines him and, and says, well, it's just your word against his honor's word. Yeah. This guy, so, yeah, the, right? What do you have? You have uh, basically sometimes just a tie, and that's not good enough. So, yeah. so we had to have the, the videotape. Yeah. I mean, I, it makes sense more and more about, I, I imagine you know, you know what a SCIF is, S-C-I-F? Yes, yes. A compartmentalized information facility. They use yeah. It for, they use them a lot for, like, uh, like hyper classified uh, Air Force projects, you know, they go in for everyone listening. It's it's basically it's. I mean, it, some of them are bigger, but it's almost like a Connex box that's just it's like EMP shielded. It's soundproof. There's no video can go in or out. You're stripped of all electronics when you go in. It's basically like the super secret place, right? It's like you and Congress a has it. Yeah, Congress yeah, yeah. used it during the uh, during those impeachment hearings. Yeah, you know, yeah. those for those yeah. interviews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's basically. <laughs> it's like the grown up version of like you and a friend going to like the edge of the, like, you know, the recess playground and being in the corner and be like, I have right. a crush on so-and-so. Right. It's, it's, it's grown up secrets trading. Exactly. But if, yeah, I feel, I'm just thinking more and more like, man, if I was ever in the, in the spot of just doing something corrupt, I think you just have to assume that you're being recorded at all times, even without if a not, doubt it's and it could come across as paranoia which works for the, the law enforcement. They want to instill paranoia, but you would just have to always be quiet. Just never assume that even if it's you and your wife at a vacation home in the middle of the Pacific, just assume 
that you're being recorded. You would have to do it all. I've often thought about this. Like if, if I wanted to, I guess, wave to the NSA, if I wanted to like assassinate the president, how would you do it? Or the Pope, you would just have, to, you couldn't, I mean, you'd almost just have to like write it down on like pencil with like, I mean, that's what they used. And Eric Schlosser's book, Command and Control, all about the nuclear, uh, the nuclear missile silos, the Titan missile silos, especially the one that blew up in Damascus, Arkansas, is one of the uh, tiers of security going in was like you had to be buzzed in and then there's like another chamber. But there was a third chamber. Once they knew you came in and they had you on CCTV, and by this point you're already like 10 floors underground, they would then issue a code for the last door and you would have to open it and punch it in and then it would prompt them to unlock it. But before they unlocked it, you had that there's a little, it's like a metal room with nothing else in there. I'm not making this up. And there's a little metal wastebasket and there's a box of matches. And you have to burn the actual thing because they were like, yeah. nothing is going in. And if you refuse yeah. to burn it, you can't come in and you also can't go out. <laughs> and so it's just right. there that tears of everything. And so I've always thought like, man, if you really want to get away with anything, I don't think you can say it anywhere. I mean, even if you're out in the middle of the woods, I feel like you would have to, I mean, you'd have to get under like a blanket and like write it down with like chalk and show someone and then erase it. I feel like there's, I don't know where I'm going with this. And you No, said, but I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. You've got to, uh, if you're a bad guy, you have to real, you have to know that where, wherever you are, there's the potential for someone to have you on tape doing whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. No doubt about it. And you know, the proliferation of, of cell phones, I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. is makes it, you know, doubles, triples, quadruples the amount of uh, the ability to have some people pick you up on, on tape. You know, it's, um, yep. it, it's, you just have to be, you know, ex extremely, extremely careful or, or, you know, in your, your example of killing the president or killing the Pope, you've got it. It's a suicide mission. You've got to give it to somebody who doesn't care. You yeah. just go in, yeah. you know, and do it. And then, you know, understand that you're going to get uh, killed. And there are people who'll do that time. You yeah. Know? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, cause yeah, I mean, Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah. I mean, he want, if you ever read his diaries, he, the dude, it wasn't just a political thing. It was, I'm going to be immortal. Yeah. So yeah. do it. Yeah. yeah. It's, I know there are, there are nuts who, um, psychopaths. who, who do that, who, who Psycho do that, who do that. Psycho. You know, uh, with, with, look, with voice recording, sorry, I was interrupting you. No, 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 no. Go ahead. I'm, uh, I was going to say voice with, recordings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were just saying about you know, especially with the abundancy of cell phones. I always think about, I think about every like Alexa or Google Home sitting in everyone's home, and they say it doesn't record you. Just like we knew for a fact that the NSA would never do domestic surveillance. We knew that for a fact, right? And then what comes out, and then. To go further, in one of James Bamford's books about the NSA, he talks about the importance of voice recording. Because in my mind, I was always like, if it's not video, then how can you tell that it's just not someone impersonating or you could just deny it? Apparently, you're, you have to use a high-fidelity microphone, but your voice is up to 100 times more unique than your fingerprint. You have like a voice print. Well, vo we use voice prints all the time, you know, with um, in, in investigations. Voice prints are are excellent, and I and I have, you know, I've been in, involved with situations. I did a lot of murder cases, and there are a lot of people who were taped. I shouldn't say a lot. There are people who were taped um, issuing threats and things like that. And and yeah. you know, when you have them on tape, and they say it's not me, well, you know, uh, there's a way of proving that uh, they're wrong. You know, one of the other things that we use, talk about old videotape, is when I was um, riding homicide duty, when I was a, a young assistant DA, one of the things that we, we always did was we had a video camera in the room when we took a confession from a defendant yeah. and witness, witness statements. Because um, it's, there's nothing like turning on that video camera at a trial yeah. and, uh, and playing it in front of a jury. And believe me, I've had some of the worst people you could ever possibly imagine say that I didn't say that, you know, you confront them on cross-examination and, and you say, um, they say, no, I didn't, I never said that. Well, I, you know, you just wheel out the, the television, pop the tape in, or uh, I'm really dating myself here with a tape, but yeah. pop the, uh, the device in and say, isn't that you? Isn't that what you're saying? It's over at that point. Yeah. You know, it's over. Well, let me give you an example. Go back to the judges. 
when we picked up Garson and brought him to the, um, we brought him to that army base to do the, to, the questioning. Um, and I'm telling you, it was the, the one of the supervising judges called it the gulag. I think yeah. I write that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that. Tom, it was freezing. There yeah. was snow on the ground. There was no one around. We put him in this room. And when I sat down, gave him his Miranda warnings, he was with his lawyer. And um, he said to me, nah, I, I didn't do any of that. I said, really? And I gave him, I gave him, I said, well, let me show you what we have, Your Honor, because he didn't think that we had anything. And we had our detectives outside. I did literally did this, wheeled the TV in, popped one of our recordings in, and there he was. You know what happened after that? The lawyer said to me, Mike, can you just wait outside for a minute? Left the room. I would say 10 minutes later, the lawyer comes to me and says, um, he can give you the head of the Democratic Party in Brooklyn because he wants to get out from under this. That's a true story. That's exactly what happened. The lawyer who was the witness against him did the same thing. He said, no, 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 no. I said, really? I said to him, Did you, didn't you break the judge's candy dish in yeah. his chambers one day and he how's, goes how's scooter doing yeah i did say yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah so you know it's um it's it's the kind of evidence that is um I, there's no evidence that's totally invulnerable but you know it's the kind of evidence that um, that's terrific and now you know with the development and with the improvement of of video it's a good thing, but it's also ha it's a double-edged sword because there are people who say that there are machines in which you can do, quote unquote, photoshopping of you know video images. And um, but you know you have to. That's why you can't depend just on the videotape. Project Veritas has just the tape, but you know you need the witness in. You need somebody to, to kind of give you give it the you know the the imprimatur that it's that it's exactly what happened. You know yeah. so. It's um, well, we have deep fakes now. You seen those yeah. deep fake? Deep fake. They're called deep fake. Have yeah. Those videos. I, those. The it's it's you just it's you can just you can make anyone look like anything. You could yeah, take me yeah. and like blend my face with like Bill Clinton, and you could have me talking about bombing Serbia or something. And it's mm -hmm. the more t the more processing time. There's, it's the longer you let it process, the more realistic it gets. Granted, it's still in its infancy, but I mean, go to a flip phone, a black and white phone, and look at that and say, that's going to be the next big thing. It's a flip phone. You go, just give it time. And now it's like, this isn't even a, a new iPhone, but it would still blow the shit out of anything from the 90s. Exactly. It's alien exactly. technology. Hey, listen, I did, I did a case against two wise guys. They committed a murder. It was a, uh, of a guy who was a rival to them, who was selling drugs on their territory. And, and uh, this guy who they killed was, um, was one of these all American boys. He was a high school football hero. He was, uh, he was, had a good job on wall street. He, and the case went nowhere until somebody came forward and said, um, you know, I think I had this little piece of information and we built the case we made a case, but you know, I, I knew that I had the right guys and I had one witness who, happened to be in a jail cell and the the one of the eyewitnesses to the case had had a police uh, artist draw a sketch of one of the guys that did the murder and when this this witness was in the jail cell slash defendant in the in the, in the jail cell he looked at the, the 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 photo which was hanging up in the or the drawing which was hanging up in the police station and said to the detective come here they, haven't you caught uh, his name was Joe Beef. Haven't you caught this guy Joe Beef yet? So they said, what are you talking about? He said, that sketch is Joe Beef. So where, what I, where I'm going with this is that the, the uh, ability to have, in addition to the, you know, to the actual, to a videotape, the ability to have a witness who has that kind of knowledge of the people that are involved in the investigation or involved in the crime is it makes the case that much more, um, yeah. that much stronger. In that case, we had no videotape. So I knew that it was not gonna fly if I had just this witness. So we went out and found, the, so a total of four witnesses who told not only this, the, the, the crux of the story, but also little bits and pieces that, um, that kind of made it a complete puzzle. You know? and, um, and my argument to the jury was that, you know, maybe one guy can be attacked, two guys can be attacked, 
but three and four basically doing, not saying the same thing because they weren't parrots, you know, they weren't, um, because that's another argument that a defense makes is that, you know, they're too rehearsed. These guys gave little bits and pieces that kind of say to the jury, you know what, that guy does know what he's talking about. And, um, but that coupled with a videotape would have been, you know, there wouldn't have been a trial, Tom. There wouldn't have been a trial. The defense attorney would have look to, um, you know, to, to plead out and, and work a deal if we had that. Yeah. But, um, you know, and it worked. It worked. Yeah. These guys, I convicted both of these wise guys. They're in, they're still in jail right now. Yeah. yeah. So. And in a, in a way, video and audio, that also kind of strengthens the, I mean, I would say it strengthens the justice system because if that becomes the norm of you have to provide that, if you can get video and audio and it's just like 10 different candid angles and, and days of me, and every time a subject comes up, I'm just like, oh, yeah, no, fuck that. Like, no, I don't do that. Tommy, you sure right. you don't take money from this guy? I'm like, dude, fuck no, dude. Like, I, I've got a podcast. I'm, I live above my parents' garage. Like, I'm just doing, you know, it's, they get that so many angles. You get to a point where it's like, that guy candidly is like saying in confidence, he has no idea what you're talking about. And so it kind of helps, right? Oh, without a doubt. Granted, again, I'm nauseatingly optimistic at times, so I can see where it's like, you dumb bitch, this is going to be used against you. But yeah, so I got you five more minutes. What is going to happen right right now? And I, I try pretty hard not to bring politics in this podcast, but this election's in the air and it's kind of hard not to talk about it. What do you think is going to happen with, and not even not even for political outcome, do you think that they're going to expose fraud Either or, it doesn't matter for who. Again, I'm not trying to make an argument for or against Biden and or Trump. Do you think that they're going to find some some fraud? I, I think so, but I'm so pessimistic about the way that investigations happen in Washington these days yeah. that I don't know anything will come of it. You know, I just, um, I mean, I, I can't imagine a stronger case than what they have already in terms of the whole Russia, you know, yeah. dossier stuff. And yet there's not a some poor schmuck lawyer for the FBI is the only guy who took a plea, yeah. you know, because he admitted to changing documents and to make an FBI form say something that it didn't say, you know? So um, I, I believe that, um, that there is a deep state. And I think that, um, is. you know, I yeah. think it's, I don't think it's going to happen. I, you know, as I said before now, whether or not um, I just, I do think that this is not going to be settled today, tomorrow, next week, it's going to, this is it's going, going to go going to a long there. way. This long is going way. to go exactly if they're, if, if you could imagine an election in the form of 2020, that's exactly what this is. Yeah, exactly. 2020 exactly. is, yeah. I don't know why I'm so surprised. Of course, 2020 did this. It's yeah, really- I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised at all. I think that it's a, um, I, I think no matter what was going to be the outcome as far as uh, you know, the number of, on election night that somebody was going to say, it's not right. And we got to do this no matter which side it was. Yeah. You know? I, I, I do, do really believe that, that there was a Fox made a big mistake with that calling Arizona right. when it did, oh, yeah. because that had a psychological effect on, on a lot of people. And there was still votes out there, you yeah. know, still people voting. That, so. that wasn't, that wasn't incompetence. I think that's, that's, a, that's psychological. That's right out of the psy- psyop handbook. Exactly oh, I agree with you. I agree with exactly you. I think that there were, you know, you talk about these, the never Trumpers, the never Trumpers were everywhere and including, including in at Fox. And um, so that was a really big, I remember I was watching, I happened to be watching. I didn't watch much of the night, but I happened to be watching at that point And I said, Whoa, what is that? Yeah. And um, you know, I, I didn't really understand it, but you know, I watched till, till 5 AM and I was watching I was just watching and it was just, I was watching all these, um, I was watching some of these like more liberal streams and they're all just like, fuck it. God damn it. Trump won again. And they're just going on. I was watching. It was kind of, it just kind of seemed over and I was watching it and like, I just screenshotted the, uh, electoral, but I, I remember the reason why I kind of stayed up was cause it was at like two or three. And I don't know why I'm trying to make it sound like I was exclusively watching I was playing video games and listening to an audio book. It was just an excuse. I was like, oh, I got to pay attention. This is American history. It's bullshit. I'm just shooting Nazis. And I'm yeah. like, I'm doing something good. But I was, I was watching and I was like, but I just remember seeing the like, because uh, I kept refreshing like the percentage of votes in. 
And I just I saw it pause uh, because I'm OCD about. I do this with watching my own videos on YouTube, seeing the numbers go different times. I like watching right. it changes over time. So I was watching it and I was like, oh, they're kind of freezing, because I've I've come to like notice really quickly when something's like sketchy with my stuff. And I was like, oh, they're freezing. And I thought it was my internet, and I kept checking. I was like, they're freezing. I was like, why are they all freezing? And then one by one, these states. None of the ones that had been called for Trump and none of the ones that had been called for Biden, but the ones that were still being decided and were leaning Trump, and this isn't an opinion or a, or a bias, this is, this is a fact, Wisconsin, Michigan, they all, all the Pops. voting, they just stopped. And I was Pops, like, I know. my first thought was like, oh my God, there was like a terrorist attack. I was like, something happened. That was like 2020, damn it. But then they're like, everyone's going home. And I was this is only the fourth election I voted in. I'm 30, but I was trying to think. I was like, I'm ashamed, but I actually couldn't remember. I was like, wait, does does voting normally stop? I actually couldn't remember. I was like, maybe it does past a certain point. I don't know, midnight. No, something. counting doesn't stop. The voting stops. But the voting counting stops. The counting. And yeah. I was just trying to think, and I was like, I was trying to think of 2016, but I went to bed for that. But then I was like, Obama, Romney, Obama, McCain. I was pretty young, but I do remember like Bush Gore, and I remember that was weird. But I was like, maybe it stopped, and it just stopped, and it stopped in all these. And I was like, that's weird. And then Trump came out at like two in the morning and was like, you know, we're gonna halt this because we don't want anyone finding ballots at four in the morning. And I just kind of laughed. I was like, I was like, yeah, that like because that is a thing. Not sarcastically, that is a thing. And I woke up the next morning. I was like, how the fuck did these flip? And then it's like, what the statistical impossibility that is. 168,000 votes came in for Biden in Michigan. Oh, sorry. 168,000 ballots were found. 168,000 of which were for Biden. Not for yeah. Trump and not for Joe Jorgensen. And I was like, oh, I know. It's, it's, it doesn't make like, sense. That, I was like, that's a little hairy. It's getting a little sketchy. And then it turns out that he had more, Biden had more votes than there, not Democratic votes, Biden had more votes than there were voters yeah. in Wisconsin. And I was like, it's you know a little creepy, but then Trump calls to stop the counting, and I'm like, well, that's not good either. That's not good optics. And then I was just like, I don't know what I expected. Of course, 2020 just takes a big old shit on the electoral yeah. process, and is like, have fun, y'all. But that's it. <laughs> that's hey, it. listen, you gotta you gotta have me back. We gotta talk about the um, the I'm dentist, I'm... the uh, the corrupt dentist who was stealing body parts. We yeah. haven't gotten to that uh, that, that story. Was creepy as hell i don't know if you yeah. i don't think you play video games in the off chance you do grand theft auto 4 which came out in like 2008 one of them and it takes place in new york liberty city one of the missions is you go you kind of go like take these two bodies from a morgue and like you bring them somewhere and the guy throws he's like where are you like your character's like what are you doing with these bodies and he's like there's a doctor that takes them and they use the tissue and i remember playing that video game and i was like that's such bullshit this is too and then listening to your book and i was like Oh my God! They're actually body snatchers. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, well before we, Mastro Marino. Yeah, I was gonna say before we even do the um, uh, family one, let's uh, let's set up let's set up one for the body snatchers. Sure. By any chance, do you have your your calendar? We don't need to do this I right do. now. Any chance you have Sunday the twenty second? That's my next opening. I have guests every day until then. Hold on. I've got that whole week actually yeah i'm not it's 20 second i'm not sure because it's uh I, i'm supposed to be taking my sons out for uh, one of their birthdays on that day so gotcha. how about during the week how about the 23rd 24th something like that whatever you want 23rd. okay how about uh what's 24th looking like for you that's fine 24th yeah what, t what time works for you um this time works we did PM eastern time what's that say 2 one p.m eastern time 2 p.m oh, sorry it's it's I, I normally do two o'clock. I'm sorry. I'm losing my mind. Yeah, no, that's fine. I'm going to put you down. That's becoming a thing now where I just, I'm now scheduling guests at the end of episodes. I don't know why I don't wait to finish recording. I guess I'm just impatient. We're good. Two o'clock on the 24th. We'll talk about um, body snatchers. Talk, the body snatchers. There yeah. You go. I got you on. It's terrific. That was some creepy. Terrific. That was some creepy shit. Yeah, I was going to say, we can segue into that. My uncle did his residency. He's brilliant. He went to Duke Med School and did his residency at Jackson Memorial in Miami, which does more than 51% of all of the organ transplants in the Western Hemisphere. And he worked in the top floor where the helicopters come in. So at the most traumatic spot of the trauma hospital. Right. 
he told me right before I got into med school, he told me, he said, take organ donor off your card. And I thought he was fucking with me. And he said, take it off. And he goes, because if it's not, I can tell you for a fact, one, they won't work as hard on you. Two, before the helicopter even lands, you'll be marked up with a marker like a, like a, like a stake. Who's, yeah. who's getting what? Because there's yeah. a lot of dirty money and people, there's a billionaire that needs a new liver. He goes, he'll get it. I tell people that and they roll their eyes. This guy, this guy is a physician. This guy is a, is a respected physician and listening to your book, certainly granted yours was with dead bodies, but still, I don't know. I'm getting, uh, don't listen. You know, I'll give, just leave this, leave, yeah. say this with your, with, to your, your audience, this case with dead bodies, as you say, and created more, um, I guess, uh, reaction or the greatest reaction that I have ever had in all my years with the families who, who, when we told them that their loved one had been ravaged before they were uh, embalmed or cremated in terms. And I mean, ravaged, as you yeah. heard, you re heard from the book, um, they were, they were beside themselves. And every time the case was on the calendar, we had a courtroom filled with family members who were ready to, uh, if they could, they would have taken Mastro Marino's head off. I tell you, they, yeah. that's how, how angry they were. And um, it had nothing to do. One of the lawyer, when I first called his lawyer and said, you know, this is what we have. He said, well, what's the big deal? It's only, it's dead bodies and it's, you know, just paperwork. What, there's nothing here. You're never going to get a jury to, you know, to convict this guy. Well, yeah. Wait until it's your family. I won't give you the. I won't give go give, give away the ending at this yeah. point because it's a good yeah. ending. That is some yeah. But people often wonder they're like, "What do you care? It's a dead body," until it starts to be someone you love and you realize yeah, they're exactly just being, they're being handled like a like an expired gallon of milk. Yep. Yeah, just go throw it in the woods and you're like they're just being ravaged. Yeah, just shit. What was that case in Georgia in like the early two thousands? That family that wasn't cremating. They said they were, but they were just stacking the bodies in the woods. Yeah. Do you remember yeah. that? That I do remember it vaguely. I don't remember specifics, but uh, me neither. Hey, look, when we when we raided this guy's garage, he had meat freezers Ugh. in his garage, and we Ugh. opened up the freezers, and there were body parts in the freezer. So that is some ghoulish shit. Yeah, it was. Let's it was. save that for the next episode because okay. we're going to go into it. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much for coming on. For everybody listening and watching, Crooked Brooklyn, I will put it in the description and the top comment, and it'll also be in the thumbnail. It is every oh, there it is. Fantastic book. It's only like what? It's only like eight hours, seven, eight hours. In terms of audio. That was great. That's very yeah, doable. That. Yeah, everyone right. listen to it. It's a great book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I wouldn't have had you on if I didn't enjoy it. I would have been like, Bruce, this guy sucks. Yeah. <laughs> but no, of course. I liked, I liked it. People say that too. I am I am brutal. I don't give a shit. If someone's book is it sucks and I think it's gonna be terrible and be like, dude, get lost. I don't want to talk to you. Your book was awesome. I, I thank you. It. Thank you. Thank you. Until next time. Stay safe. Until next God time. Bless. Thanks, God bless Tom. America.